Hey, it's Robert from Sierra Landscape Management. So we have not actually made a video in all the videos we've done about how we build our NARA flagstone patios. And several people have reached out to us and they've said, hey Robert, we'd love it if you could make a step-by-step -step video of how you guys actually build your patios. So here we are, this one's for you guys. I hope it's helpful and informative. So one of the very first things we do when we get on site, so obviously we gotta bring our equipment, trailers, tools, all that. But we have to make access. We have to make a safe and reliable road where we can bring our materials in throughout the course of the job. Typically we're on site for several weeks and during that time, you never know what the weather's gonna throw at you. It could be snowstorms, rain, wind, freezing temperatures. You never really do know. So we wanna create nice, stable roadway where we can bring in all the gravels, rocks, patio materials, get our machines in and out, and not make a tremendous mess, at least any more than we need to, for the property, the homeowner, and the community. So, what you see behind me is, after one day, we've created our road, which we just walked down, and then what you're looking at behind me here is the excavation. This is what we call the cut. All right, the ground underneath the soil that you see, it's commonly what's referred to as the subgrade. And then over this, we're gonna put our base and we're gonna walk you through that. So what we've done here is we've excavated our patio. You can see the white line along the back. That white line represents the edge of our patio. So we want our overdig to be about 12 inches, about one foot wider than the actual surface of the patio. Okay, that's gonna give us a little bit of flexibility, but also make the edge of the patio just as strong as the middle. All right, we're down about 11 inches than our final surface. That's gonna give us an eight to nine inch base. And we're gonna use a couple different gravels for that, which we're gonna walk you through. All right, the elevation of the patio is determined by this existing staircase. That staircase is not moving. So we've determined that the rise for this staircase is six and three quarters between each step. So we want our final surface to be six and three quarters below that bottom step. So our immovable point that we're gonna measure off is that bottom stair. We've gone ahead and we've dropped down approximately 18 inches from that top step. And then we've also sloped our grade here. Our grade is sloped out, so any water that does accumulate on it will drain away from the structure. This is our subgrade. We're gonna go ahead, we're gonna install a geotextile fabric over that, and then we're gonna go ahead and install our sub base, which is our first layer of gravel. So right now we're in the middle of installing the sub base over the subgrade, and we have this permeable geotextile fabric in between. So like I was saying before, we go ahead and we install the fabric. What that's gonna do is that's gonna prevent any migration of the rock into the, into the subgrade and the subgrade from pushing up into the rock. It's gonna keep everything nice and clean. And then for our particular applications, we like installing a one and a half inch clean gravel. That means there's no fines, there's no sands or anything like that in between. It's just clean crushed rock and that goes down. We go down about four or five inches as a layer there. We'll go ahead, spread that out, we'll compact it, and then we'll go ahead and install our three quarter inch gravel on top of that. That's actually what's typically referred to as your base. Uh, so we're actually gonna have three different grades of gravel as we build up to prepare for our patio. So, all right, I can pretty much guarantee we're gonna get some comments on this one. What is geotextile fabric and what geotextile fabric do you use? Well, it's not that simple. So this is a 12 foot roll of a geotextile fabric. That just means it's a ground fabric, okay? This is not a weed block. This is not something you're buying at the box store. This is a specialty fabric. This particular fabric is what's referred to as a non-woven geotextile fabric. It's kind of like a felt-like material. This material allows water to permeate through at a high rate. Okay, this would actually be what we would commonly use like behind retaining walls and things like that. Now, on this particular site, we have 
already assessed the soil and we've determined that although there's some clay in here, there's also a lot of sands and gravels. So this material, the subgrade that's here, is gonna do a great job of accepting the water that is gonna permeate into uh, the base material layer. All right, so any water that would get in there would soak down. And what we wanna do is make sure we're not trapping that in with a more traditional woven stabilization fabric. There's definitely some benefits to going with a different type of fabric, a stronger fabric, what is commonly referred to in the hardscape industry as a woven geotextile. The downside to that is it's nowhere near as permeable. We've established that the grade that we're building on is firm and solid, so we're not concerned about settling or sinking. Okay, we're mainly concerned about making sure we're not getting migration of soils and gravels into each other, as well as allowing permeability through. So that's the particular material that we've chosen for this job, but it will vary because we have jobs and you'll see it on our YouTube channel where we've used woven geotextiles. It really just depends on what we're building over and what it is we want the end result to be. These fabrics, you can typically buy them at hardscape and masonry supply stores, drainage supply stores, at least good ones. Uh, you know, and the rolls vary by size, but you know, we're buying rolls that are four or 500 feet long and you know, they tend to run about a dollar a foot, give or take. So our crew is gonna go ahead. They're gonna continue installing this clean gravel bedding layer until we complete the patio. We're gonna go ahead, compact it. We're gonna make sure the elevations are where they need to be. And then we'll go ahead and install our three quarter inch base material. The guys have been at work starting to put down the three quarter inch clean gravel. That's gonna be our base. That's going to be what is underneath the bedding layer. Now, you're probably asking what elevation do we set that? So we actually install our base, our three quarter clean in two layers. We're going off this stair back here. And off that stair, we are looking for nine and a quarter inches below the top of the stair to be the final surface of the compacted base. So what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna set the first round of three quarter to 10 inches below that stair. We're gonna compact it, and then we're gonna take out our screed pipes, our metal pipes, and we're gonna pull the final layer across, and it will be perfect, it will be sloped, it will be everything we need to just go ahead and run the bedding layer right over the top of that. All right, so our guys have just finished up the first lift of the three quarter inch gravel. They're gonna go ahead, fine tune it, compact it. It's about six inches thick. They're gonna compact it. We're gonna put some screed rails on top and we're gonna really, really hone in and fine tune that final layer of three quarter that's gonna go on top. And that's gonna give us our final base surface. I'm sure the question is gonna be coming up, how thick, do we put our gravel? Well, in this instance, we're five to six inches, but we wanna view it in lifts, because sometimes we gotta go a little bit higher than six inches. So as a general rule of thumb, we never compact more than six inches in a lift, but really it's gonna matter based upon material and the size of the compactor. The smaller the compactor, the smaller the lift can be. You know, you might have, depending on the materials and the size of the equipment, a lift anywhere as small as one to two inches, it could be as great as six inches. Once you get above that, without a lot of complicated equipment, you can't verify compaction. So for the sake of what we're doing with this open graded gravel and the size of the equipment that we're using, a six inch lift would be sufficient. They're gonna finish this up and then we'll go ahead and screed out the final layer. The guys have gone and screeded up the top of base. So what we do is we rough out the first layer that I showed you before, six inches, compacted it. And then we take these screed pipes, you can probably see the metal bars that are back there. We set those to the exact elevation that we need our base, plus or minus 16th of an inch, eighth of an inch. We go ahead, we screed our three quarter inch gravel over that. And then we'll go ahead and compact that and our base will be true 
it'll be perfect, it'll be pitched just the way we want it, and that'll make the final screening of the bedding layer extremely easy. So the next step the guys have gone and done is we're screening out the bedding layer, the final layer. We're doing an open graded gravel, so we're using a 3 8 clean stone. We've gone ahead and set up six screed pipes. Those are exactly where we need them, within a tolerance of about a millimeter. And then we're gonna go ahead and take our 3 8 stone, and you can see the uh, screed bar behind us, as well as the screed pipes. And we're just kind of pulling it along, and that's gonna give us a perfectly true flat surface to set our stone on. One thing to take note of when we're setting this is all along the process, we've been keeping everything sloped. So we have a one inch per 10 foot slope and that extends from the excavation, the subgrade, through the sub base, that bigger gravel that we put down before, and the three quarter inch, the final layer, and now the bedding. So if you were to take a level and put it on top of the pipes, running away from the deck and out, the bubble would run up. What that's gonna do is allow our final surface to drain off. We don't want a truly flat surface because we don't want water to pool, but we don't want it so sloped that if you're sitting in a chair or you put a glass of water on the table that it feels obvious. So we tend to go with one inch to one and a half inch per 10 foot. So that's gonna drain out that way. So these are some of the stand-up bluestone pallets that we've selected for this job. They come about two tons for a pallet. We get about 50 to 60 square foot per ton. So each pallet's gonna give us about 100 to 120 square foot. They come caged. The one thing you wanna always be careful about with any sort of stand-up material is once you cut that cage, once you cut that band, you never know if it's shifted in sh uh, during trucking or getting delivered to the job. So the one thing we always do is we make sure we put a strap on it, want our guys to stay safe. The last thing you want is one of these slabs. They, they can weigh a couple hundred pounds uh, coming down. So the guys have go ahead, went ahead and started prepping the, uh, the largest pieces. So we personally like to pepper in a lot of large stones amongst uh, the medium ones. And so we've always found that it's easiest to do this first. So the guys will go through the pallet, they'll pick out some really nice stones. They'll just kind of rough them into place and then they'll actually go and trace them out and start cutting them with the saw. For cutting, we're just gonna use a regular uh, gas-powered demo saw. We're always gonna cut wet. We don't wanna create any dust or a nuisance for the house or a safety or health concern for anybody in the area. So we're gonna cut wet using a diamond blade and uh, yeah, something like this. They'll probably get this done uh, this afternoon. And then once that's done, we'll go ahead and level these and then we can go ahead and start peppering in the material in between to finish this off. So Dan's going and he's washing off these stones because all the rough we wind up cutting in place. These are two to four man stones, are very heavy, anywhere from 100 to 300 pounds and they're just a little too much to be moving from the cutting table back and forth. So we actually lay them out, we cut them in place, and then everything else we cut away from the patio area. So as you can imagine, when you're wet cutting, that's, that can be a little messy. So we come through and we, uh, we hose them off, and this is what you got when you're done. If you notice those joints, I mean, we aim for a quarter inch joint. Those are gonna typically be filled with a polymeric sand. And uh, 
Another option could be stone dust. If the person was intentionally looking to grow moss, we would take some uh, moss spores and mix them in with the stone dust and put them, and then in about six months, I'll have moss growing. Uh, or if they want a true permeable application, maybe on a lakefront, maybe there's a concern for drainage, flooding, pooling, or erosion, they want to stay with a true NARA system, we'd put a quarter inch stone chip, very small stone chip in there, and that would allow it to go ahead and permeate through when it rains, so the water would not actually run off of the patio. Uh, we have a couple videos on that, including how to maintain your NARA patio, which my boy Chris will put up top. So this is at the end of day one. We've laid out, I'm gonna guess about 175 feet worth of this patio. Because we're not fitting edges, this is the fastest part of the patio. The remaining 300 square foot, that's probably gonna take about four days. The guys are gonna average probably about 100 square foot a day. And then on top of that, we got the final day of cleaning, sanding, uh, trimming up the edge, that type of thing. So probably the middle of the next week, We'll be uh, rocking and rolling and moving on to the retaining wall and other elements of the property. So we'll go ahead and show you our cutting station. Try to keep it kind of close to the area where we're working. So we got our pallets over on the side. This is just some of them. We bring them in as we need them. We got our gravel over to my left in case we need any more for adjustments. We typically will stack anywhere from like four to eight pallets. So whoever's cutting has kind of a table to work on. And then that'll transfer over to our bench. That's where they're gonna get chained. Or hammered, chiseled, depending on what we're doing. And then ultimately they'll wind up on the patio. You'll see tomorrow as we go on and we're creating the fill of the patio. We'll have one or two guys in the middle of the patio marking. Dan will probably be bringing over to Mike, and Mike will be doing the cutting, which I know he's excited about. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll probably blast out about 100, 125 square foot each day.
So as you can see, we've finished sweeping in the sand, we've tamped it down, we've watered it in, and we've given it a couple days to dry. And this is the final product. Obviously our guys have come around and sodded and finished up the landscape while that was happening. But let's take a quick overview of what exactly took place here. So we started our project out by excavating. We removed all the grass and sod from the area and we created what was known as our subgrade. That was the top of the soil of which the different types of gravels will go on top of. So we went down from that bottom stair. We took the height of the stair, which was six and three quarter inches. We dug down an additional 11 inches. And that was the top of our subgrade. Our subgrade, the soil underneath, was sloped because we want any water that accumulates on it to drain out. So we sloped that away from the stairs, one to one and a half inches for every 10 feet. And then over that, we laid a geotextile fabric. The fabric is to keep the soil from pushing up into the gravel and the gravel from pushing down into the soil, the subgrade, and basically just keeping everything clean. On top of that, we put four to five inches of a one and a half to two inch clean gravel and we went ahead and pushed that down. We compacted it, graded it out. And then we went ahead and put about another four inches of three quarter inch gravel on top of that. And that's actually what's referred to as our base. That was screeded out and leveled to be extremely precise. Again, sloped away from the stairs, that one to one and a half inch for every 10 feet. And then on top of that, we put a three eighths clean stone chip. That was the bedding surface of which the actual flagstone sits on top of. Once that was screed out, screeded out, leveled, and made as nice and flat as we could get it, we went ahead and we took the flagstone and we laid it out on top of the bedding layer. You saw the guys cut and trim each stone, fit it together, and lay it out in the form of what you see here. After that was all done, we went ahead, we checked everything, made sure all the joints were tight, consistent, just like we like them. We aimed for one quarter to three eighths inch uh, size joint. And then we took, for this particular patio, a polymeric sand, went with a gray color, and we swept that into the joints. We go ahead and we, we tap or vibrate the stones to go ahead and get the sand to migrate down into the stone itself. And then we go ahead and water that in per the instructions of the manufacturer. We give it about 24 hours to dry, and then we go back and we do the landscaping around it. So all in all, this particular patio is 450 square feet, plus the walkway that's additional. It took our guys four and a half days to complete the final surface and another two days to excavate and set the base all up. So all in, this patio portion of this larger project took our guys a little over one week to complete. And we used, let me think, we used, including the walkway behind us, uh, eight and a half pallets each pallet ranging about two tons. So we used approximately 16, 17 ton for this project behind me. As you can see, the guys are wrapping up the sod and we've built a retaining wall that you can see in the back there. As always, if you found this helpful, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you as to what it is you would like to see in your own backyard if you had Sierra by. Go ahead and check out one of our other videos. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.